Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe out of there. My name is Victoria, and I'm a Senior Business Development Coordinator at 2H Offshore. With many industry events and conferences canceled due to COVID-19, we put together this series of live webinars to keep our valued clients and colleagues up to date on the latest happenings in the world of riser and conductor engineering. I want to welcome you all to our webinar today entitled, How to Clamp Unseated Subsea Wellheads for Life Extension. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few important housekeeping items. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you soon, so please look out for a link to that in your email. Secondly, if you have technical or content-related questions today, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can use the Q&A box that is located on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll go through as many questions as we can, but if you have further questions, feel free to contact our speaker directly after the presentation. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Nick Prasevich. Nick has over eight years of specialist engineering experience in the design and numerical analysis of shallow and deep water riser systems, including drilling risers, jack-up systems, completion risers, and conductor systems. He has notable experience in component design using 3D finite element analysis, including analysis of wellhead and conductor systems to determine fatigue damage in North Sea wells. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Nick to get us started today. Thanks, Victoria, for the introduction. Uh, it's good to be here today, and uh, hopefully you all find the information in this presentation useful. So first off, I'm going to go through the agenda to give you an overview of the, the topic today. I'm going to start with a, a field overview, um, give you a bit of background to this case study that I'm going to look at. Uh, and its kind of operational history. Uh, and then after that, I'll give you a kind of uh, rundown of the, the global riser analysis activities, which is a kind of bread and butter work that we did on this well um, a little while back, uh, covering historical fatigue. Um, and then I, what what the client or Chevron in this case wants to know is, can we come back to this well and do future uh, operations? Um, and then some of, some of the uh, other things in, in that regard. Uh, and then after that, it's on to the kind of specific problems that uh, were encountered on this well that required some, some more thought and more bespoke solutions to them. So firstly, I'll uh, give you a rundown of what we mean by wellhead dislocation, um, uh, how that was discovered and why it has occurred, and then what the remedial actions are to, to get around this and ensure that uh, you know, the, the well can be operated on in future and, and the life of it extended. So I'll cover the, the clamp overview, what its purpose is, uh, how it was designed, uh, the finite element analysis, so how we verified that the clamp uh, does its job uh, and also is structurally capable of taking the loads that it will see because it's connected to a wellhead uh, with the riser connected and, and will have loads passed through it. And then at the end, I'll go through the manufacture process and some of the testing that we've done to date to prove that the, the clamp is, is ready to be installed. So first off, uh, a quick overview of the field um, discovered in the late 1970s in the North Sea. Um, first production didn't occur for about 20 years. Um, the technology wasn't there initially, so um, once that was uh, more developed, uh, the initial drilling operations were performed uh, and then they produced from the, the well. Um, and then in the last kind of 10, 15 years, um, there's been a, a, a project to further uh, recover oil from the well uh, with further developments in technology. Uh, again, it's become commercially viable to do so. Uh, and it's you know, a, a question of, of life extension and making sure that the, the well is uh, not a uh, going to be susceptible to any issues because of its previous operations. So um, these wells are non-rigid lockdown wellheads. Um, some, uh, it's quite common to see these wellheads in the North Sea. Um, they're not put down anymore, at least not that I know of. Um, but if you look at a lot of older well designs, the, the low and high pressure housings are non-rigid lock, which means there is some movement between the two of them. So the, the high pressure housing sits on the low pressure uh, housing via a load shoulder, but uh, when there's a riser connected, they will move relative to each other. And this is fine. It's not as robust a design as, as more modern ones, but um, the key thing is is making sure that uh, you determine if, if slightly higher loading is, is an issue or not and, and mitigate for that. So 
key point here is that you know, aside from the, the the design being a bit older, there's you know the the as uh, as is uh, kind of configuration isn't uh, as it was designed. It's it's not often kind of it's not uh, sitting as it's intended. Um, so remedial action is required here in the form of this clamp, so that we can return the well to its initial uh, condition and then allow for it to be operated on again. And we see this a lot on older wells, be it platform wells, subsea wells, um, whether it's replacing an old component, re-verifying it, or using something for something that wasn't intended. Um, there's it's quite a common uh, occurrence when looking at life extension. So briefly, I'll go over the, the redrill operations that are, are now being planned. So uh, there's going to be redrills performed in a number of the wells. Um, the kind of bread and butter analysis that I mentioned that we did on the global riser system was done for two wells in this field um, and the, the same vessel is being used on both of them. Uh, the riser stack up shown on the right here, um, these are drilled from a semi-submersible and the riser stack up is pretty typical of what we see in the, the North Sea in terms of water depth, uh, riser configuration, wellhead. It's all, all quite typical in that regard. Um, Looking into the historical operations performed on it, there are a couple of well-specific things. Um, you find all um, conductors and risers have their own quirks um, and different levels of uh, data available for them. So some of the things to be considered here are the met ocean conditions. Um, they're both in the same field, but they're operated on different times. So summer and winter, as it goes without saying, have quite different um, sea state conditions, um, different vessels have been used uh, and some of the wells have been connected on for longer just because of the operations that were required on them. So the future operations of the redrill uh, is going to be done with a fifth generation semi-sub rig. Um, so we can calculate how much fatigue damage from the, the cyclic bending loads from the vessel has been accumulated in the swellhead over the historical operations and then you have a baseline and and it tells you how much residual fatigue life you have left to go back and do any, any future operations. So I'll quickly go over the work scope. Um, it's not really the interesting bit, but um, as I mentioned already, fatigue analysis, in this case, driven by wave motions is the, the main driver. Um, we also did an operating analysis where we define operating windows and tension settings and things like that. Um, but all of that stuff is, is fairly standard. Um, the, the key uh, point is that it's all based on the as-designed wellhead configuration, so the wellhead operating as it was intended to operate. Some things particular to these wells, um, I mentioned already that the, uh, the, the well is sort of quite old in design, and that affects the type of wellhead, so it's a non-rigid lock wellhead system. Uh, the welds between the, the housings and the extension joints below are also F-class welds. Um, nowadays, you would see a much higher grade of weld. Uh, D-class is probably quite conservative. Uh, you get C or C1-class is quite common. And you can spec that when designing new welds, but when it comes to old ones, you're, um, it is what it is. You can't go back in time and, and change how these were designed. So it's a question of uh, making sure that you uh, have a sound analysis approach uh, to when looking at these so you can remove any conservatisms that you don't need to be there and then possibly looking at mitigations when you go back onto these wells. Um, when it comes to semi-subs, um, I mentioned it's a fifth gen vessel that's being used here um, and with the drive for bigger BOP stacks in recent years, uh, the damage from a fifth gen vessel is an order of magnitude higher than you would get from a third gen vessel. Um, so the the loads are higher and then the resulting fatigue damage is significantly higher. So well, these old uh, wells maybe don't have such good well details and that, that could well be okay in the past, but when you come with a, a newer vessel and connect to it, it may give you some, some issues. Um, and the context for these wells, um, to kind of wrap up the summary of this, is that uh, kind of the, the baseline fatigue damage means that um, either the fatigue life would, is close to being exceeded or will be, I know will be exceeded during the future operations, or you're kind of already at that point. So it's a question of uh, minimizing the risk when you reconnect and, and putting mitigations in place so that you can keep the, the fatigue damage to acceptable levels. And it's always a kind of risk-based assessment, taking the best operational approach to do that. 
So just a, a kind of tracking of the fatigue damage over time to illustrate one of the key mitigations here, uh, and that's the use of a BOP tether system. Um, these are quite common in the North Sea and, and some other regions as well, and they're a very good way of um, reducing fatigue damage. Uh, so you can see the fatigue damage in some of the, the key components uh, tracking over time. The, the red line there is the low-pressure housing weld, which was the, the, the highest uh, fatigue uh, component in this case and you can see that the the last operation the damage kind of shoots up so that's with the the new vessel on the fifth gen and this is the without tether scenario so it, it, it's a pretty drastic increase in damage and we did it both for summer and winter months there's quite a difference but you're still in trouble either way so the mitigation here is, is using a bob tether system i won't talk any more about that here because it's not the, the focus of this presentation but um, you can see it's a pretty drastic difference and you end up with a pretty uh, uh, different picture to what you had before, particularly if they come do this in summer months with tethers, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a big, big difference. As I mentioned, this is all based on the wellhead being in the condition it was when it was put down 40, 50 years ago. So um, a lot of things can change in that time. And in this case, the, the wellhead dislocation is the issue. So. Um, I don't have any fancy pictures to, to show it, uh, but it's pretty uh, straightforward in, in terms of what's happened. So the image to the right here shows a subsea wellhead. You've got the high pressure housing welded to the surface casing, and that sits on a load shoulder inside the low pressure housing, which is welded to the conductor. Um, typically, it looks like the image shown here, but as the on the right, the, the blue arrow denotes the, the high pressure housing is moved up by two inches here. So that's what we mean by dislocation. Um, and it's a result of a lock ring failure uh, combined with thermal upthrust. So it's not known exactly what happened first. Um, you can make a pretty well educated guess at it, but um, it's likely that the it could be that the lock ring failed because of some default with uh, some fault with it, and then you know the thermal load will just push the housing up, or it could be that the, the thermal up thrust was was higher than anticipated, and that caused the failure. Um, so in this case, it was discovered through an ROV inspection in 2017, um, and uh, one of the the likely causes uh, is the heat chest effect, which is uh, the effect of having multiple wells all producing at the same time when they're close to each other. You can't really treat the wells individually. They all heat up together and there's like a cumulative heating effect. So that may have played a role here. Um, it's something you could look at um, and kind of model, but we haven't done that in this case. It's just one of the suspected reasons for it. And one of the interesting things is that the wells didn't re really it when they were taken offline. So certainly why, for whatever reason, they did fail. The, 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 the lock ring failed, the, the high pressure housing moving upwards is, is, is a result of thermal loads uh, and you know, the wells are taken offline, they cool down, but the uh, the high pressure housing hasn't gone back to where it was, which is, is interesting. It has some implications for designing the, the clamp. So why can't we leave them like this, other than it sounding quite alarming? Um, you have a much higher, you know, even, that, even that two inches, it means the high pressure housing is going to take considerably higher loads and be much more susceptible to, to fatigue damage. So um, we didn't analyze that scenario, but it, it's because we know it, it wouldn't uh, be deemed acceptable anyway. So it needs to be remedied to allow it to go back onto the well. Um, before I go into the wellhead clamp itself, um, just a little bit of background on some of the inspections done. It's quite interesting. Um, there was inspection performed on one of the other wells in the field um, that's being, it's not being re-drilled, obviously. Um, this was pulled up and the low-pressure uh, housing welds inspected to see if there's any evidence that fatigue could have caused uh, uh, you know, some issues in, in the wells. But the, the findings of this were that some tracks existed, but they were ones that hadn't been growing, so all welds have tracks in them. It's why they have poorer fatigue details than parent materials. In this case, there were some, with, some cracks in the wells, but they hadn't been propagating, so it would have been during manufacture, and, and that wasn't the cause, which wasn't the cause of any failure. So it gives some further credence to the, uh, the heat chest effect possibly being the, the driver of this. 
So the, the wellhead clamp itself, um, which is kind of interesting bit about this job, um, Chevron came to us with a design for a, a clamp to, to re-socket the, the wellhead. Um, so it's custom because there's no other kind of application for a clamp like this. So it was um, a kind of blank canvas uh, other than the initial design that, that Chevron came to us with. Uh, and it had some, some requirements that influenced that design. So um, on the left here, you can see uh, this is taken from the analysis model. Uh, and you can see the, the wellhead, the low and high pressure housing, and then the lower half of the clamp pushes up on the uh, low pressure housing and the upper half is getting pulled down onto the uh, high pressure housing so it it pulls them together and um, the downwards force is was calculated and uh, agreed upon uh, as one of the, the key input parameters so in this case 600 kips of force was required to reseat uh, and and keep the uh, keep the uh, high pressure housing reseated um, and you'll see from the, the pictures that it's kind of segmental, it's in layers, this clamp. So there's an upper and lower section, uh, you can see, and then in each of the sections, there's three layers, so upper, mid, and lower, and each piece is like an 180 degree um, piece. So uh, this is all driven by how the clamp is installed. Um, there were some preliminary designs, which I'll show in a minute, uh, which would have worked in terms of the clamp's function, but this needs to be installed by divers uh, with the subsea tree in place. So, because you want to have it on as soon as you're connecting anything else and connecting a riser back to surface. So, it's important to make a clamp that works, but it's also important to make one that minimizes operational risk when you install it. And this is the same for any application. If, you, if you're designing some new equipment to be installed, it's, it's one of the drivers. So, one of the key things to make it dive install was to keep the weight down. Um, and that's why it's segmental and it's got these layers to it. Um, and the reason that you see from the, the schematic, if you look at the one in the middle, there's like the middle uh, layer is kind of rotated 90 degrees to the upper and lower ones. That's just uh, part of the design so that you don't have a, a loss of stiffness where you have like the 180 degree pieces fitting together. So it kind of introduces some, some complexities that you need to account for and a lot more work but it makes it a much more uh, practical solution. Uh, some images of the initial design just to illustrate some of the initial concepts that, that were brought and um, this is a kind of just two pieces here that, that clamp together um, but uh, far too heavy for diver installation so it was ruled out pretty, pretty early on uh, in favour of the, the finalised design which I just showed you. So once we had this kind of layered design, um, it was, you know, we started analysing it to see if it was strong enough to do the job or strong enough to withstand the loads it would see when it's in place and also that it would uh, provide the, the preload into the wellhead, uh, the clamping force that we wanted. Um, so we analysed it first with the, uh, the concept that was uh, given to us by Chevron um, and it was deemed to be too heavy still. So we did some optimization, looking at the initial results and then refining things, uh, taking out material where we can based on where the stresses are. And you know, if, they're, if they're low in an area, basically means you can you can remove material in some way. Uh, so we got an overall 30% reduction in weight from that initial uh, concept. Um, the, the, when thinking about installation, it's not the assembly weight that's really important, it's the weight of each part of it. So uh, in the original clamp geometry shown on the left, particularly in the upper uh, part of the clamp, you can see that the, the grey body is a lot um, chunkier than the other parts. Uh, and it doesn't need to be. So it meant that it was considerably heavier than some of the heavier than some of the other parts of the clamp. So the reduction in that was almost 50%, uh, and that got it to a, a weight that was suitable for diver installation. And we kind of op we optimized so that each part of the clamp was similar in weight uh, because it's the most efficient way of doing it. So some of the functional requirements of this clamp uh, I mentioned already um, and it has to resist uh, an upthrust force and it's got to re-engage the, the load shoulder and the, the wellhead between the high and low pressure housings. So um, when you've got a kind of a layered design like this 
it's not one body, it's lots of different bodies bolted together. So one of the, the criteria when we're analysing it is to make sure that it, nothing's sliding around and that it is pushing on the, the load shoulder as it's intended. Um, and as I mentioned, installation is a, a key consideration here. So uh, we had an installation procedure and instead of just putting two halves together and talking up your bolts, you've got lots of you know, uh, increasing the number of bits you need to put in and then you've got more bolts to, to tighten up and things like that. So uh, we came up with an installation procedure and, and, and got that in place for installing the clamp. So the, the structural analysis that we did in this to, to make sure that it's robust, I've got some images from the analysis here. Uh, and I'll just cover some of the key uh, design considerations. So uh, code checks, in this case, were performed to ISO and API codes. Certifying uh, new equipment like this, or if you are going back to re uh, revalidate some old equipment, or whatever it is, uh, is always dependent on uh, who is looking to use the equipment and where it's being used as well. So, um, DNV and, and British standards and other codes can be used as well. So, we, we typically work to whichever is appropriate, uh, and some of the common ones are in here. Um, I mentioned that it's, it's not all one part uh, or one body. Each of these layers is, is bolted together with a pretty high preload, but um, similarly to how a non-rigid lock wellhead, your, you know, your load shoulder is well, the, the main difference between the, the non-rigid lock and the rigid lock is that the load shoulder uh, isn't uh, preloaded, so it's fixed in place, and the, the high-pressure housing may slide a little along the, the low-pressure housing where, where it's hung off. And the same is true of the clamp here. Um, if it isn't bolted up enough, you would get a kind of nonlinear response where things start sliding. Uh, and here, there's not only the, the clamping force in the axial direction, which helps, but you've got the, the bending loads coming from the, the riser that's connected. So they're trying to move it side to side. You get tension on one side, compression in the other. So you need to make sure that things aren't moving around and if they are moving around, it's not necessarily a problem. You just need to make sure that that's captured and that you've assessed that it still functions and it's not overstressed. So to model that, then frictional contact is modelled. So it, it captures, if there is any sliding, we'll capture it in our, in our assessment. And that's something that's very hard to quantify in uh, hand calculations. So when it's, you have things sliding together, usually it's a kind of finite element solution. Um, and we did elastic and plastic analysis Key thing here is, is being uh, not being over conservative with the design. Uh, so some plasticity is okay. You just need to know where it occurs and make sure that, that it's not a problem. Um, and the, the driving uh, criteria for the strength of the clamp in this case was that it's as strong or stronger than the wellhead. Uh, no point in making it twice as strong as the wellhead because you shouldn't be connected to your wellhead if you're seeing loads that high. But um, we don't want to introduce a weak point into the system here. And another thing was that it was all forged uh, pieces in this case. Uh, Strength-wise, uh, having it rolled out from plates and welded would be fine. Um, but then you have the possibility of introducing uh, new welds, which may have uh, their own fatigue issues. So uh, you don't want to fix one problem and then give yourself another. So in this case, So onto the manufacture and testing of the clamp. Um, the yield strength, so I mentioned it was at four pieces, and we had to control over the yield strength, uh, you know, how strong the steam was used for each of these components. Um, and it's different, uh, I won't go into the details of them, but it's, it's different for certain different components. So the, the clamp body itself, it wasn't the, the most highly stressed part of the assembly, um, the bolts, because they're seeing the preload and they're kind of long and slender, see quite high loads. And then the sleeves for the bolts, which I'll point out in a couple of slides, they uh, also see quite high loads. Uh, and I'll give it a background on why the sleeves are there. And um, the coating, uh, we spoke with various uh, coating suppliers. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the type of coatings used subsea and what, what requirements you need to consider. Um, 
one of the important things from an analytical perspective here was the friction coefficient because some are more slidey than others and uh, that's fine but you need to make sure you have your coefficient of friction in your analytical model matching what uh, is specified by the, the coating uh, supplier uh, and that's something you can verify through uh, physical tests that we did and we saw quite a good match in this case or quite a good match I mean the a good correlation between what the coating supplier said and what we saw, which is gives us confidence that they have uh, good data and uh, supply to us. Um, the bolt torques uh, are also reliant on that, so depending on how you coat them depends how much torque you put into them. And one of the testing thing uh, outcomes was we were torquing them up to a certain value, and we knew what uh, force in the bolts in terms of the compressive force pulling the clamp together we wanted. So we wanted to measure that and make sure that for a given torque, we were actually clamping with the force that we wanted. Um, anytime you're in, in this design, you have 16 bolts. You need to consider the order that you torque them up in and what increments you do it and things like that so that you don't put on a clamp with, you know, 10% variation and uh, force applied through all the different bolts and stuff like that. Um, so some practical considerations there. Um, machining tolerances. Um, I'll skip kind of back to one of the slides here to maybe illustrate this point. Um, so if you if the image on the left shows a clamp on the wellhead, um, the key job of the clamp is to provide the, the preload force. Um, and it's got sections that have kind of, uh, you know, it's like L-shaped. Um, so when you're defining the tolerances, the, the wellhead itself will have some tolerances. Um, so you need to account for that. And then uh, if you have like two L-shaped pieces that you want to slot together, um, with vertical and horizontal faces you know, 90 degrees apart and um, you're never going to get a very tight fit on both the horizontal and vertical faces they're always going to be uh, you could do theoretically but it's most likely that you know you could end up in the wrong side of your tolerances in every aspect and um, horizontally it's flush but vertically it's a little bit off or whatever and it's likely when all clamped together um, and torqued up this would you know squeeze itself into place but we prioritized the horizontal faces because we need to pull the, the axial force through those and engage the load shoulder in the wellhead. And we did do some, some sensitivities where you know, what happens if the vertical faces aren't quite touching in places uh, and just made sure that you know, it's unlikely, but covered all bases there and made sure that it would still still work. And that was another um, thing that we were looking for in testing. Do we have a good fit on the, the wellhead? Um, so yeah, the machining tolerances were part of that procedure. So we specified those uh, kind of in, in conjunction with Chevron, uh, who managed the, the procurement. So they got this uh, manufactured and, and provided us with feedback on what is realistic in terms of tolerances. Uh, and the same goes for the yield strengths. Um, and, and we came to agreement on, on what works there. Uh, and on to some uh, kind of images and information on the, the manufacturing testing that's been done so as i said um chevron managed the the manufacture of the clamp uh, and we went along to to witness the testing uh, and this is in aberdeenshire uh, near where we're based um, and we we talked up the the bolts in the clamp to the recommended values to give the required clamping force and and took readings of the natural force in the bolts as i, as I mentioned Picture of the testing facility here, just to show what it looks like. Uh, rare sunny day in the left in Aberdeen. Uh, and the next slide is uh, just a, an exploded view of all the, the parts of the clamp to, to illustrate the, the full assembly. So I mentioned earlier, just to, it's a, it's a good slide here to, to show what I was talking about, there's sleeves for the, the bolts. So you can see here the, the bolts with their blue coating. A nut on the top and they are bolted through these also blue sleeves you can see the, the sleeves sitting in the top and the one at the bottom that's kind of fallen out where there's no bolt and um, so these sleeves uh, are there uh, just to relieve the stresses in the bolts so the different layers of the clamp are all kind of we've got some they're bolted together we're going to try and want to move yeah, and, and induce shear stresses into the bolts um, but the bolts are, are tensioned worked up to quite high axial load values so we want to instead of 
really struggling with finding very high yield strength bolts. Um, the idea here is that you install the sleeve, which is thicker. It takes those shear stresses and, and relieves them from the bolts. So the, you can't see it, um, the ones that are in, because they have a nut on the top, but the, the ID of those sleeves is actually a little bigger than the OD of the bolts. So they take axial forces, but not much in the way of the, uh, the cyclic bending loads that can act laterally, other than the the flex from top to bottom of the clamp, which, which isn't a whole lot because it's clapped onto a wellhead. They, they don't really see any any shear or bending loads. So I mean, they don't have to go crazy with the bolt um, The wellhead here, as you can see, if, if you're looking at the um, the wellhead, which is the slightly shinier piece in the middle of the clamp, um, it's not got any kind of profile on it. This was just a, a manufactured um, representative wellhead to, to fit the, the clamp onto. Um, other things to point out here, I talked about installation uh, being a kind of key thing. You see these little yellow um, kind of brackets on the side there. These are just installation aids. Um, if you're trying to think in your head how you put this on a wellhead, you have to put it on without um, it's falling to the seabed or <laughs> falling down below. So you, the, the upper part of the clamp will just sit on if you because it's sitting over something. But the lower portion um, needs to be held in place at times until you get the bolts in place. So. That's what those are there for. Once you've got the top half in, you can support the bottom half and get all the bolts in and, and get everything torqued up. And just a, a second picture here, again, showing the clamp from a slightly different angle. You can see a little bit better the load cell on the on the bolt there. And you can see the large torque wrench that just has a kind of top cap to, or socket to, to tighten up the, the nuts there. And there was some discussion around uh, using some bespoke tooling to get the, the tension to the bolts. But after the testing, it was deemed that it's it's pretty straightforward as is. So there's no need for anything. So what did we learn from the testing? Um, well, we, we successfully torqued it to the, the, the preload value we wanted. Um, we've got some useful information in terms of the order in which we torqued the bolts up um, and, and the increments to use so that we were measuring the same preload in all of the bolts, or close enough. Uh, we verified the coefficient of friction supplied. Um, it was actually pretty spot on in this case. There was some, you know, some doubt over uh, whether the, the, the data sheets from the vendor would be entirely accurate, but they were, they were pretty good. So that was, that was good to see. And then um, you know, we were checking for fit on the, the wellhead, making sure that the load shoulders engaged and see that and we saw some uh, back you probably can't really see it in this photo but where the, the 280 degree sections at the top are coming together it, it kind of wants to pry itself apart because you're pulling on both of those bolts and you get a slight um, kind of opening there and, and we saw a good correlation between what we'd uh, analyzed in our model and what we saw there so that was a good verification that the, the stiffness and we're seeing for the load supply is, is pretty spot on. And yeah, so we, we knew that under at least the, the preload, obviously it isn't sub C with um, a riser connected, but we were seeing consistent behavior what we expected for the uh, in a dry test case here. So in summary, um, some of the useful, interesting parts of this, um, D damage is a common uh, issue or a consideration for, for older wells in the North Sea. Um, and in this case, um, not just you know as it was designed, but also because there's some, some issues in terms of well degradation and uh, in this case, the, the dislocation. So um, when it comes to life extension, be it just through corrosion or um, older components or things moving around uh, or doing bizarre things you don't expect them to do, we get a lot of um, inquiries to can we either recertify equipment? Um, so in some cases, it, there may be a flange or a connector that's you know, very old and the, the capacity chart you get is a bit suspicious or you know, very poor um, because it was either done using hand calculations or rudimentary FAA uh, many years ago. So often it's just a case of uh, doing some more advanced up-to-date analysis on it and saying actually the capacity of this is well in excess of what you thought 
and it's fine and you can use it or, or maybe not but often that is the case that you know using more modern techniques proves that older components do work or it could be that um you know things have moved and um you need a special component like this to to put something back in place in, in which case you're analyzing a new component to and then also checking that it affects the existing conductor or riser or whatever it is in the way you want and sometimes it can just be um, oddities of certain wells. Um, a good example is we had a well where they were planning to uh, platform well and they planned to tension the conductor using the rig tensioner but it was quite far from like the, the cantilever of the rig and they couldn't use the, the rig tensioner. So in this case they wanted to uh, use a tension unit so designed that and then that raised questions of um, you know we're putting a tensioner unit on a deck it's not designed for it to tension a riser. Is the deck going to buckle or are we going to have any issues with fatigue and welds and things like that? So that's the, the loads came from the riser analysis in that case, but the, you know, the, the bits we're analyzing are kind of far from it. Uh, so you get, you get some interesting uh, remedial scenarios. Um, in terms of this clamp, um, we, I'd say we've got to the stage of testing and uh, it's, it's going to allow um, Chevron to to redrill these wells and, and and do what they want to do with them rather than and having to go back and drill a new well which um, manufacturing a clamp isn't cheap um, it does cost them money but it's a lot cheaper than, than drilling a whole new well so it's a uh, it's a very interesting solution here quite straightforward uh, <laughs> you know a clamp isn't isn't there uh, isn't anything new but it's its application is quite interesting That's all from me. So um, thanks for your time. It's good to give you a little bit more information on this. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them now or uh, send me an email. My details are on the screen now. So feel free to get in touch. Thank you, Nick. Um, we have had a few questions. Um, I will start asking those now. And if anyone else has any more questions, just keep sending them in and we'll go through as many as we can. Um, the first question was, what were the main challenges in selecting the clamp design? Um, so I think the first it was, you know, we were aiming just to design it to, um, to, to give the required clamping force and be structurally sound, which was relatively straightforward. Um, you know, nothing too special about it. And it was designed with the intent of being installable, but then I think as we looked into our, a Chevron where, you know, Speaking to the people going to be installing it, we realised it really it wasn't. And then a lot of the the challenge was making a clamp that was easier to install rather than one that would like do its job once it was in place. Um, and part of that was how far you optimise it as well. So like you could you know spend a lot of extra money refining it and refining it until it's the most bespoke, well optimised clamp in the world. But at what point are you kind of you know do you need to do that? And are you better just to stick with the solution that you? Okay, thanks. The next question was, how is the force required to re-socket the wellheads calculated? And what happens if it requires more force? Um, good question. Yeah, uh, so the initial kind of question that leads into working out what the required force is, is why are they not going back down? And um, so we had some, some back, uh, back and forth with that. Um, and it's like, I mean, we, we we're pretty sure why the they unseated, but why they didn't reseat uh, is most likely, uh, you know, if they were uh, producing for a long time, there may be some reconsolidation of soil. You know, your surface casing goes thousands of feet down into the uh, below the mudline, and then it could be that it's just holding it up enough, and you know, you, you tap it with a hammer and it, it slides back down. Or more likely, it, there is some considerable force there that you'd have to overcome before it um, it it goes back down. So the Trying to calculate how much support from like reconsolidated soil and cement or whatever else is down there is holding the casing up. Uh, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> you, you just don't have the the knowledge of what's down there to, to do it. Um, but knowing the the length of the surface casing, which is the high pressure housing that's above the top of cement, you know what that axial stiffness is. So if you apply enough force, you will just 
squash it a bit. You'll compress the surface casing, and even if the uh, supporting soil doesn't budge, then you'll you'll squeeze it back into position, um, and it'll just get a little bit shorter. Uh, it will be interesting to see what um, load is required, you know, because you could be torquing it up, and it'll you know, before you get to the 600 kips, it's it's free seated. Um, but we did also design a, a fair bit of contingency into it, so that if we need more than 600 kips, uh, we can go up to kind of what it was closer to a thousand before you were having any concerns over stressing it. So, better on those. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, and I hope I'm understanding this one right. Um, could you provide some more information on the allowable bending moment? Um, yeah, so in most of, like I mentioned, other applications for similar things, whether it be a clamp or um, a connector or, or whatever, um, the loads are, there's two things. You need to, des you need to know um, what the boundary conditions are and they need to know what the, the loads are. And, and the loads usually come in, in type of work we're doing from the, the riser analysis. So the global riser analysis I talked through at the start, um, we've already done that. So we, when doing fatigue analysis, you look at the C state scatter diagram, you model the whole riser system, and then you run these kind of long-term waves to the system and you get like a history of the, the bending cycles that go through the wellhead. So that part is is what we, we typically do in projects, but then if you need to design a specific component, that's, um, you know, you could get someone to design a component for you. That's often the case. Um, someone will come to us with the design, but you need to know what the load history is to see if it's um, it's going to work. Uh, and then when it comes to strength, it's um, you can either design to a, an extreme uh, condition like a, a hundred year storm, for instance, or a one year storm, and usually codes and standards define that. Or in this case, we just if it worked, we already had operating envelopes defined, and we knew what bending moments would overstress the wellhead, so we just designed it to be at least as strong as that. Okay, thanks. The next question is, was this installed on a producing well, and if so, did the design include for thermal displacement as a result of the well cooling during shutdown? Um, so it's going to be installed in a producing well, uh, but has not yet been. Um, so at the moment, the wells are offline, but still unsocketed, as I mentioned. Um, and then when the tree is in place, we'll install the clamp. And then when you torque it up, it will, if, if it does its job, it will uh, it will reseat the wellhead. So in the in the cold condition, still right. So then once you take once you drill through through it again, it's not going to heat up as much as when it's producing, but it'll still try and lift upwards. So we need to uh, make sure that it doesn't. Uh, you know, we don't. You know, we've we've designed it so that it it won't um, you know, lift off again with the clamp in place. And and when it cools down, um, you know, anytime you take it off, it wants to cool. But uh, it's not so much of an issue because um, if it cools down, you like when it heats up, you're going to put more tension to the clamp and try and pull it apart. But when it's cooling down, it's just the, the wellhead is going to shrink a bit, and the clamp's going to kind of not do much, if you will it's going to see less stresses, so it's not really uh, a concern for it. But there will be an effect that, that you need to... Okay, the next question is, do we know why the wells didn't re-socket when they stopped producing? Um, yeah, I feel hopefully I've covered that one already um, with the, the first response, but um, we have a good idea why. And we did discuss it quite a bit when uh, at, at first um, and the you know, because if if they just had, I mean, if you caught them just as they unsocketed and you just cooled them down, they should just slip back into place. But um, given the time that they've been unsocketed, uh, it's likely that soil is reconsolidated and, and things are just stopping. You know, it's supporting that high pressure housing. So um, as well, it's been producing quite a long time. Okay, perfect. I think we've got room, room. Sorry, time for one more. Um, the last one is: Is there any use of the clamp in other applications? Um, this clamp, um, it's no. <laughs> uh, for this clamp, it's um, designed kind of specifically to fit around. Uh, you know, this is an H4 wellhead system, so it's, it's specific to this application. But um, this kind of um, analysis and, and design of 
just, you know, just bolt clamps or connectors or seals and things is, is quite common. Um, we see similar with um, companies like Claxton who uh, often design and then manufacture like overshot connectors to, to reconnect to uh, conductors that have just been cut and temporarily abandoned with no well ahead. Um, really quick have a pause grip connector, it's kind of more standard product, but um, there's quite a few different um, similar type connections that maybe need to be tailored to a specific application and um, the kind of principles, you know, getting the global loads right and then designing the, the component to stand those and do its job is, is all quite similar to, to this application, albeit this one has a, a clamp very specific to it. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Nick, so much for all the information and for answering those questions. Um, that's all the time we have for today, but um, like I said earlier, if we didn't get your question or if you think of some more questions when you uh, watch the recording, you can contact Nick directly using the details provided here. And thank you all to our audience for your time and your participation. We hope you found this useful and you'll join us for more webinars in this series that are happening every two weeks during our time at home. Um, you can check out the 2H website for more details and to sign up and follow us on LinkedIn. You will also promote them there. And you can look out for the recording of the webinar in your email in the next 24 hours. So we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you. Thank you.